Okay, so uh, we changed the order of the presentations. Uh, the most important yeah, the one is first. Desktop. Uh, and therefore, uh, Professor Abin Yamini will now present uh, his uh, research uh, on uh, data mining uh, and uh, informatics. Uh, we have to mine your presentation here, but fine. Uh, oh, yeah. As you know, the HPP is composed of three major platforms. It's not actually a small thing, but three types of platforms. And, and uh, one of them is the or, or directions. One of them has to do with uh, medical informatics, uh, with the idea in mind uh, to cure all diseases by understanding the epidemiology of them. I don't know. You, you will tell us. It's a mystery for me. So you have, uh, who is uh, one of the world's experts on on uh, data mining, uh, will uh, tell us how to do that. Uh, it's a mystery for me, uh, even more than uh, understanding how the brain works. So, um, my talk will be about somewhat different, in the sense that I will speak uh, more about uh, difficulties and challenges than about uh, achievements and so on. And in some sense, I would use our Human Brain Project uh, work, uh, which is uh, this uh, a group with Mia Marcus and then Tal Galili will speak later today, uh, Alexis Mittelpunkt and uh, Neto Shaha, and I'll uh, use this opportunity to discuss uh, some problems that are shared across uh, all uh, effort to address this kind of problem. It's the kind of thing. I've taken this from the goals of the medical informatics platform. And it says that uh, we would like to build tools to federate clinical data, including genetics, imaging, um, but using current hospital data. And that's the main feature here. Uh, to develop tools for making it possible to extract biological signature of disease from the multi-level data of patients. And uh, moreover, to make it possible for others to use the platform that we're preparing in order to do their own research using this data. And in that sense, I think it's just uh, appropriate to discuss this uh, sort of the difficulties that everyone will have to face when he's starting to work on that. So uh, we're doing big data mining of urology patients' data in hospitals. I will speak about uh, a few topics. And if I don't finish them, so be it. So I'll speak uh, about a roughly structured data of very different types. Uh, discuss the point that we have much data, but few people. And that will be surprising, but that's the usual situation, and then I'll devote time to discuss the problem of applicability across science, and this example from the human brain uh, analysis, reproducibility, confidentiality, and finally uh, about leakage in databases. So what do I mean in terms of hierarchical structure of medical data? Think about uh, you coming to a physician and what he's doing, how he starts to interact with you. So you present your complaints to the physician, and then he starts to write it down, and he does a physical examination, and he does a physiological examination, and if you come with a nervous, a problem of the nervous system, he will do some test, and if needed, he will do uh, questionnaires, and so you will have, and maybe give you some uh, blood test, which will have a lot of uh, items in it, and if you have to go to images, then you have images, either MRI, if it's fMRI, you might be exposed to different tasks and maps of the brain, and if DTI or PET and proteins and so on and so forth. And the point is that uh, if it sends you to a blood uh, test, then you will have all of your blood uh, uh, information and so on and so forth. And the, uh, the structure of this data is hierarchical. This is a, a way of looking at that. So you have, uh, uh, say, uh, measures of long-term memory, which are items which are taken, uh, processing speed, working memory. All of these are clinical variables. Is uh, further, I prefer moving my head. 
Am I being heard also? No. Ah. So I need this because I can't interact with the screen. So I need this. Um, Forget it. <laughs> no, no, forget it. Fine. That's, that's better. So, um, so the structure is that you have kind of uh, image, image data, and you have clinical data, and it's all built in, and you go inside and inside, and you have this uh, structure. So that's one phenomena of, uh, of this uh, data, clinical uh, data. A second point, important point, is that you have huge amounts of data but essentially about a few people. And that's very typical uh, of uh, the problems in, uh, that are related to uh, brain studies. I'll give uh, one example from our own research, uh, looking for association between genomic uh, variations and volume changes in the brain. This is data from the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, the ADNI study. Uh, the data was accumulated uh, during studies at Thompson's Labs and UCLA. Now it's not at UCLA. And appeared in print by Stein. And the immediate goal was basic research, just to associate, just to associate the um, uh, changes in the brain uh, with uh, genetic markers with the fun goal of determining biological markers of Alzheimer, but not necessarily at this stage. So the method that was used by the original author is to correlate uh, volume differences and the number of minor allele for each one, adjusting for age and gender. And this is essentially the picture, which is the result of the analysis. Uh, but uh, you have to remember that you have some 32,000 voxels in each image, and you have about half a million SNPs. All we see here is these five SNPs, most promising SNPs. So if you look at this problem, on each person you have half a million measurements of genetic variation. You have 30,000 volume changes of brain voxel. So simply the number of tests of association that we're making is about 13 billion tests of associations. Okay, now we have a huge number of patients, 600 patients. In fact, the entire study uh, up to now has uh, enlisted 21,000 people. If you think about the number of people who across Europe who has this disease, it is not 13 billion people at all. It's a, a few orders of magnitude below that. So the point I'm, uh, I'm trying to make is that there's a huge amount of data, but practically there will always be too few uh, subjects or too few patients. And especially as we concentrate and try to go to personalized medicine, we are trying to get to smaller and smaller groups, this will always be the case. Now, this was the only picture that appeared in the original paper. Now, where did the 13 billion results disappear? Well, nobody is interested in them. These were the five most promising SNPs. And of course, for each of these SNPs, we see only the slides and the red part in them, which are of interest. The point is that selection and huge selection takes place here. And this is a common feature of higher dimensions. In these large problems, those inferences that are not selected are simply ignored. There are so many of them that even their identity are not reported. Needless to say any further details, in some situation it appears in the database, but often even that is not uh, happening. Mm -hmm. However, the selected one, oh, the selected one are presented, are highlighted, are discussed in the abstract, appear in tables, we have p-values for them, we have confidence interval for them. I mean, they are really those that are kept and discussed. And this really raises the concern of what this selection does to replicability of scientific findings. <coughs> Sorry. And this is my next issue. Now, 
Uh, I don't know how much you have, you have heard about that, but replicability, the problem of replicability has um, gathered uh, importance and uh, a, a, in the last uh, four or five years, uh, to the point that uh, results, scientific results, do not seem to be replicable, and this has reached the outside the scientific community into the wider community. So this is, for example, uh, an article from uh, the New Yorker. And if you can read the titles of that, uh, it's the truth wears off. And it's more letters, is there something wrong with the scientific methods? These are the kind of questions that arise. And uh, this was from year 2000. More recent references is trouble at the lab, in the economist. Or you, you know that John Allaire, John Allaire himself was called Lyon. Yeah, <laughs> but not in this article. In fact, it was a beautiful one. <laughs> um, so we have the trouble in the lab, and we have the new truth that only one can see, but no other scientist, and so on and so forth, and many examples, and some examples in, this, in the psychological, or quite a few examples in the psychological sciences, and I will discuss some of these. Now, what protects us as scientists at the end? What protects us is the fact that the main principle uh, in scientific discovery is that they are always subject to further scrutiny by other scientists. The point is that a discovery should be replicable. You should be able to get similar results. Now, this idea has a long history, and it goes back to the seventh century Robert Boyle, during his debate with uh, Thomas Hobbes over his air pump and the nature of vacuum. And that was the first time that he presented, I don't know how much you know, but Robert Boyle was one of the founders of modern science in the sense that scientific paper has to have a method section and it will have to explain in English and not in Latin what it should be done. And uh, you, you shouldn't quote what you've heard, but only what you've seen. And that uh, was a big change in that. So Boyle maintained that the foundation of knowledge should be constituted by experimentally produced facts. And by repeating the same experiment over and over again, the certainty of the fact will emerge. Well, how many times should it be replicated until uh, the members of the Royal Society will agree that it's enough and they will accept the fact? That was about it at that time. And, um, and uh, interestingly, uh, the air pump was also a complicated uh, and expensive to build. And uh, outside of England, Huygens was the only natural philosopher who built an air pump that didn't involve boy, uh, boil and hook his aid. And when Huygens noticed a new effect while using his air pump, and tried to communicate it, it became clear that unless the phenomena could be produced in England, with one of the two pumps available there, then no one in England would believe that the claims that Huygens and Baker are real. The point was, in fact, that Huygens traveled to England, it's, it was for a couple, for three or four months, and produced the experiment and did it first without wall and repeated it again and again uh, for two or three times, and here was the restoration of this. And finally, and this was convinced. And in fact, this was the first time that replicability became the gold standard of science. Um, the addition to that was uh, adding significance to that. And Fisher, in his uh, matter, the Design of Experiment book, uh, said that we may say that the phenomena is experimentally demonstrable when we know how to conduct an experiment which will rarely fail to give us statistically significant results. So the point is added is how many times the statistical significance and in fact introduced statistical significance for that purpose. So you can say whether the result was replicated or not. If you put a p-value and it's 0 0.0063, you will not get 0 0.0063 in the next experiment. But you can still check whether it was less than 0.05 or not. So it's interesting to know that this is related to, uh, to that. Now, uh, before I continue, because it's important for uh, the, next, uh, uh, the next issue that I would like to discuss, I would like to mention that reproducibility and replicability are being 
used together, and I don't mind which way you go, but I want to make the distinction, and that's the important distinction, and I'll take it from the editorial biostatistics. To reproduce a study is to start from the original data and get uh, through the analysis and get exactly the same results that you, the original investigator, have achieved. But it's starting from the same data. However, to replicate, to replicate this result is to replicate the entire study from the beginning, from a listing subject to collecting data, analyzing, not necessarily exactly in the same way, not exactly the same population, but still get essentially get the same results. And uh, the, the confusion is such that in the nature editorial that I'll mention in a minute, they say uh, the participability is being able to replicate the results. I mean, it's, it's this sort of a mixed, but the two uh, distinction is important. Now, what were the responses uh, by the leading publisher? So, recently, So recently, there were, uh, recently, I mean in the last uh, half year or so, there were editorials on addressing replicability issues or addressing the replicability crisis, in fact, in nature, in science, in psychological science. Uh, there was a document, NIH, Plans to Enhance Reproducibility, that appeared in, in Nature Methods, I think that one was. Uh, closer to us, the um, organization for Human Brain Mapping, and it's listened in its most recent uh, meeting as, uh, as, a, as a issued the council statement on your imaging and research and data integrity and put up a task force. Uh, what do they recommend in view of this? Well, the first recommendation is to increase transparency and data disclosure, which is in fact asking for better reproducibility. Being able, if you go to the data that the, the experimenter collected, you go from that and you can follow the entire and get the correct results. So that's reproducibility, and that was the uh, emphasis here as well. Good experimental design, and then some social remedies. I call them social remedies, that is, to have blind peer reviews, to specify research hypotheses, to be a good citizen, for the publisher to publish all research, not only if it is significant, and so on and so forth. And then, improving statistical analysis. That was uh, accepted by all, uh, but the problem with this last one is it wasn't clear why and how. Interestingly, in that original paper in New Yorker, by unfortunate, by the unfortunate uh, author, he put his finger right on the point. He mentioned that selection is unattended by appropriate statistical methods, even he didn't, even he didn't say it in these words. He mentioned, I will need this work why most research findings are false, who claim that uh, selecting those significant at the point of five among many should result in very high proportions of false rejection among the findings. Now, in brain mapping, we are all aware of that, and we are taking good measures to fight it, either with uh, controlling the family-wise error rate or the false discovery or things like that. The other problem presented by Schooler, dwindling effects in psychological studies. That is, you have some effect, it looks very promising, then somebody repeats it, and uh, the effect is not that large as it seems to be. And that's another one is repeating it, and it's even less so on something, Sometimes it disappears altogether. So let's ask about this question. We saw that we had 13 billion, and we selected only five slips out of them, and so on. Are these significant if you had such a huge selection? Well, uh, yes, and in fact, uh, we can identify, not this particular, but this, I saw this picture from the paper, we can identify here that there are two layers, hierarchical level, even in this study, same that we have in the medical data. First, we're interested in SNPs, and then we're interested in the voxels across the brain that are correlated with the SNPs. And using this structure, uh, we need new tools for that, and such tools were developed by uh, Bogomolov and Rosenblatt, both PhD students uh, uh, of mine, 
And uh, in fact, using the special structure, 35 SNPs were selected, allowing only false discovery rate of SNPs less than 5%. So first of all, we got hold of the SNPs. Then, within each selected SNP, significant world, uh, voxels were selected, allowing only average false discovery rate of voxels over the selected, over the selected, with emphasis on, on the selected. And this way, we got, uh, um, uh, for most of the voxels, less than 50 voxels, and the largest one, there were about 400 voxels in the region. Now, so there are ways to do that. Unfortunately, this, there is a, tr a different trend as well that puts the blame on the use of p-values rather than on the use of the selection. And psychological science is the leading journal in that, and it was Yadin uh, who brought to my attention because his paper had difficulties. Uh, why don't they use the participability? Right. Hmm? <laughs> yeah. So what did psychological science, how did they respond to the crisis? They seek to aid researchers in shifting from reliance on NHST, null hypothesis statistical testing, to estimation and other preferred techniques. We published a tutorial by coming a leader in the new statistics movement. So there is a new statistics movement. And there are 25 guidelines in the new statistics movement. And number nine is do not trust any p-value. Number 10 is simply omit any mention of null hypothesis significant testing. And number 14 is routinely report 95% confidence interval. Number 15 is submit to another journal. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, you've noticed that the, the speakers of today's talk didn't read it yet. but. Uh, they, 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 this is uh, catching uh, like fire, I'm afraid. And it's the wrong remedy. It's the wrong remedy for the drug. Uh, the point is that if you use 95% intervals, you don't run away from your problems of selection. You just have them in a different way. And I'm going to make a small demonstration because what you do keep is the average over all parameters while you are interested the average over the selected one. So let me... Let me show a demonstration. So suppose I have, I mean, we need to have some statistics, right? So suppose we have 20 things that I want to estimate, okay? And I, so these are the 20 things, nothing at zero. They're all small, but nothing is at zero. So you see, each point is at one, this is another one that I want on this nature. And I have estimators for this. I get uh, averages and I get an estimator for it, but of course there is variability, so no one really hits right on the hand, so I add confidence interval and I have confidence interval. Now suppose I'm interested only in those confidence intervals that do not cover zero. Okay, those are the interesting ones. Those are the ones that I want to report in my abstract. So here I have the three of them, and since I'm using a 90% confidence interval, uh, sorry, sorry, I want to check I want to check what confidence interval don't cover the parameter. So this one doesn't cover, this one doesn't cover, this one doesn't cover, three out of 20. Well, that's reasonable. I took 90% confidence interval. On the average, it's not bad. But now suppose I'm interested, as I said before, only in those that do not cover zero. Well, I have four of them that do not cover zero. One, two, three, four. Out of these four, how many confidence intervals do not cover their parameters? Well, now it is three out of four that do not cover. The deterioration in the property is dramatic, even in such a small problem. Okay? That doesn't save us. Going to confidence interval doesn't save us. Okay, so, uh, and, and in fact, these are the selected four that will tend to fail or shrink back because, you see, uh, the real one is further away, closer to zero, so next time I will run the experiment, it will look worse. Uh, let's bring this to more familiar grounds. I will use it to address voodoo correlation. How many people have heard about voodoo correlation? Okay, not, not, not too many. So 
uh, estimating quantities of interest correlated with brain activity from the same data used to locate the most promising ones. And this is the topic uh, uh, many in behavioral neuroimaging work with that, work with this kind of uh, question. And in 2000, that is, you, you run an experiment localizing uh, the most, uh, the, the region in the brain, which is most highly correlated with some external measure. It can be cortisol measure or some other thing. Uh, Wool blew the whistle on the practice uh, in 2009, and it took a few years, heated debates, and a joint paper by eight experts to realize that the problem is that of selective inference, or as it is called, circular reasoning or double dipping. You use the data first to select and then to infer. Okay? And in fact, what they uh, added, ended their paper with the statement that voodoo correlations are everywhere. But in fact, uh, this is what you do. This is what you can do uh, in this experiment. This experiment is the correlation. They have some loss aversion index with some gain that was given to the subject. Those are the region of uh, activity of a high correlation in the brain. And and what you have here is extremely high correlation, okay? The colors here fit to the correlation, but these are the confidence interval that are appropriate take, that take care of the selection. They are so much wider in the direction of zero than in the upward direction, and they warn you, beware. This is not when you write here, okay? When you write here and you think it is 0.6, it is anywhere from point, uh, point 0.8, it is anywhere from point 0.9, but all the way to point 0.1. It will not be diminishing the effect. Uh, our current replicability challenges generalize these kind of solutions to more complex uh, hierarchical data structure, adapt the approaches to problem arising in data mining, such as clustering and signature uh, search, because some of the fiascos that happened in signature research uh, really made the issue of replicability uh, reach the, uh, general, um, uh, the general interest of the public. I will uh, speak uh, very uh, in one slide about this, reproducibility, and to be able to reproduce the study, and confidentiality. One of the requirements when working with hospital data is that we would like to provide technical guarantees that researchers cannot link the data to individual patients except under strict medical control and so on and so forth. Confidentiality in contrast to reproducibility, to everything being transparent and so on. There is not an easy way out of this conflict, and this is very typical of uh, of the medical data mining with medical data. Uh, some direction, the computing is, dis is distributed between the hospital and hospitals bring to the center only, uh, only summaries of the data. So it's a new challenges in terms of computing. And at least the code has to be transparent and the database have pictures of it at different stages. So at least someone can run it again and make sure that you get uh, the same things. So, uh, I have two minutes or? Two and a half. Two and a half. Okay, so this is, this is a nice thing to finish with the story. Uh, leakage databases, another problem that is related to medical uh, research. Uh, the problem, I'm sure that that one, that's it's not familiar. I mean, few people have heard about it. Um, and the problem surfaced in competitions. You, you know the Netflix competition, one million uh, dollar prize and so on. And there was a recent competition in brain research, building an automatic diagnostic algorithm, diagnosing attention deficit disorder from background information, like age, gender, and so on, and images. Okay. So this is typical for this kind of competition. A database is prepared for the competitors, and you work on it. Now, uh, Saron Rosette, who won quite a few of these, actually identified the problem of leakage that can be used 
to win the edge in such competition. What is leakage? Suppose you have the data organized in a special way, and you can, this special way is related to that. For example, one hospital has more AD uh, uh, patients, and the other one has less, and one hospital comes below the other. So this is the kind of thing of leakage. The point is that the databases we are using from hospitals were not built for that, and there might be leakage because of the way that the data enters. Uh, the available sick and available healthy are not computed. But more importantly, the diagnostic tests that they passed are not the same. The only more severe one passed more advanced tests. So you don't have what you end up doing if you do simple data mining tools, you end up modeling the diagnostic process rather than who has the disease and who doesn't have the disease. Okay? So the point is that this kind of information may leak into the target diagnosis that can be revealed by the algorithms we seem promising but are useless. So I'll finish now with the... Uh, I'll finish now with the summary. So our part in, in the human uh, brain project, medical informatics problem, is that of tool forger rather than finders of the truth. Uh, and as tool forgers, uh, the point I discussed will challenge other scientists uh, in their road for searching for, uh, searching for new insight from the data federated by these projects. And the idea is that they will use it, these kind of things. So there are some solutions. There are some solutions. Uh, but more might be needed in order to derive important and replicable discoveries leading to really focus in people's uh, well-being out of this project. And the road is still long.